All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Michael Prendergast, who is a director and advisor with Allfest. Uh, he helps clients with all aspects of their pers of their investment and personal financial planning uh, matters. So welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's an honor to be on the program. Yeah. And just remind me again, what part of the country you're in? We are broadcasting from New York City today. Oh, fantastic. So the other side of the country, as I said, I'm in, in San Diego and Michael is that way, that way, this way. Is, way, is the weather beautiful and sunny today <laughs> in San Diego? Um, I hate to tell you, but it is. Yes, it's actually, uh, it's, it's in the high 70s today. Well, good for but, you. I, I always yeah. like to hear good stories. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's going to go down into the 60s the rest you know later in the week so you know we, we can oh relate to you <laughs> not like a freeze alert it's a freeze exactly. alert for san diegans exactly so what we're going to talk about today is fantastic is common investment mistakes and i think michael this is kind of a a timely conversation uh because obviously with covid and now with the with the, the you know the war in europe with the russian invasion of ukraine all of that and there's so much i think there is so much panic in i think people are kind of panicked around investments in general they don't know where to go they don't know so oh my goodness is the world ending should i pull all my money out and just stick it in a shoebox but then what happens if it's devalued then it's a waste of a basically the shoebox would be worth more than the money in it um mm -hmm. should i go to gold should i go to crypto what's going on so I, I do think i do think there's a lot of people especially i would say you know the casual investor right which is most people who are really confused about what they should do right now well, I think that one of the biggest things is don't, many people, like let's say the markets go down and many people are, many people who are, like you say, are casual investors, um, they tend to think it's called a recency bias. They tend to think that what's happened recently will continue on to happen. So if markets are going up, they assume that markets will continue to go up and maybe want to become more aggressive and vice versa, if the markets are going down, they, they think that markets will continue to go down um, and so want to get out of things. But the thing to really remember is that, you know, what are your goals? What are your goals for your portfolio? You know, what's, you know, you might have, your, your goal might, let's say, I want to have a very nice retirement. And so I'm saving for retirement, I'm investing for retirement. Um, that retirement might be many years away. Um, mm -hmm. or the goal that you have might be at least several years away. So it wouldn't make sense to radically change your portfolio based on a short-term event, um, which would disrupt the long-term performance of the portfolio to achieve your long-term goal. So I understand completely because, you know, we're all human. It's very easy to get nervous. And especially if you're not uh, working in the financial market, so you don't see this all the time. Um, and of course, people are always concerned about losing money. So I have a great deal of empathy. But one of the things to remember is that short-term variations in the market should not be dictating actions that could have negative long-term consequences. Yeah, I think that's a good piece of advice. And I think sometimes we're, we're spoiled in terms of um, experiences in the past or even because we're always hearing these big stories about, you know, a particular investment like growing x percent or whatever we never really hear about the steady ones because that's just not that exciting to hear about um and therefore i think people sometimes are looking for for when you're looking for aggressive or high growth they're looking for really high growth instead of okay i can be aggressive but i still have to be realistic about my expectations well i think also it's you're totally right and i think also part of it is because um i like to say it i'm not i'm not i'm not the first one who said this but it's kind of like a, a fishing story, right? Like when people get together and like two fishermen get together, two fisherwomen, um, they tend to exaggerate their catches, right? So they'll say, oh yeah, the fish was this big. And then, you know, as the years go on, the fish starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that tends to happen with people's, when people talk about their portfolios, when they're having, you know, a party or a cocktail or just uh, getting together amongst friends is like, oh, my portfolio is doing extremely well they tend to um, talk about their winners, 
people don't usually want to talk about the por parts of the portfolio that are not doing well. And sometimes that portfolio, even the winners can start to ex start to get bigger and bigger, and bigger, because there isn't any kind of quantifiable, you know, fact checking mm -hmm. that can be going on. So then sometimes the cl uh, clients will say, oh, well, my, my neighbor, you know, um, is doing it really well this year. And uh, they're saying that they're doing astronomic astronomically good. And how come I'm not doing like that? And I say, well, you know, let's find out, you know, if, if your, if your neighbor is willing to share their portfolio with us, and I'm not saying to uh, mm -hmm. redact anything that's, you know, social security numbers, account numbers, name of the person, we just want to see what the portfolio is consisting of so that we can actually verify maybe they're an investment genius, right? Maybe we yeah. should go work for them, but we want to be able to understand what's going on. And usually when you start to fact check, uh, things start to deflate a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree. And I think that's unfortunately, it's the kind of world we live in today with, uh, and especially now with social media and all of that, you know, we've gotten into this comparison culture where we're constantly comparing, are we, are we shaping up with all these you know, people have people we don't know and, and, and a snapshot on an Instagram can send us. And, and therefore, I think I think we're probably becoming worse even going around asking, trying to compare, trying to see how I'm doing, trying to copy other people. And to your point, it's like becoming that overnight sensation on YouTube, isn't it? Like one person, it happens for one person. You don't hear about the 10 million other people who tried it and failed miserably. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. And of course, also, you know, people, of course, people naturally, you know, money is very important. You know, mm -hmm. money, money helps families achieve their important goals. So I understand why people want to grow it as much as possible. But we will, everyone's different and everyone has a different tolerance for risk. So it's easy with hindsight to kind of cherry pick certain facts that look, look very good. Like, for example, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, the S&P and 500 did X percent and my portfolio didn't do X percent. And we'll say, of course, yes, that's very true. But that's because the S&P 500 consists of 100% of large sized US domestic stocks. Your portfolio is a very well diversified portfolio, which has bonds in it of various types. It has international stocks. It has different types of alternative investments. It has real estate. And these things behave differently. So we wouldn't want really your portfolio to be behaving like that. I mean, let me rephrase that. We would not want you to be in a 100% S&P 500 portfolio unless you were the very, very, very small percentage of the population that had the stomach for it, because just like it can go up very much in certain years, you know, in, in other years, it could go down extremely much. And you don't want to be able to, you don't want to have the highest highs and the lowest lows in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Most people can't handle that. And then they'll bail out when the mark when the S and P five hundred is going temporarily down. They'll bail out because it's too scary, and then lock in those losses. Yeah, no, absolutely, a hundred percent. So, if if somebody is starting out on investment right now, or they've dabbled a bit, or they're a casual investor, what are what are some of the mistakes to avoid? Right. Well, one of them is we briefly talked about, which is what I like to call rear view mirror investing. So that's mm -hmm. where. You're always looking in the back to see like what's done well in the past recently is going to do well in the future. So often clients will say, um, hey, you know, especially right now, it's a new year. Took a look at my portfolio. Some things last in, in my portfolio last year did really badly. Why don't we get rid of those things? Because they're, they're, I don't see why they're in the portfolio. We'll buy some new stuff and let's buy some of the things that really did well, which logically makes sense if you assume that the winners will keep winning and the losers will keep losing. But like we know, the one thing that's constant is change. So the winners are not going to be winning forever. The losers are not going to be losing forever. So for example, in 2020, emerging market stocks did extremely well. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of 2021, uh, and, uh, and we have uh, our, portf our clients' portfolios have a certain amount in international, including emerging markets. So some of our clients would say, wow, I looked at 2020, the emerging market stocks did really, really well. What, let's, really, let's really double up on those because I want more of that positivity in my portfolio. And we're saying, and, and these laggards, let's just get rid of them because they're just dogs. Right. But things will change. In 2021, emerging market stocks did the least well of all the major asset categories. Um, so 
you want to really have a diversified portfolio. And I guess that's kind of segueing into another topic, which is that for a, for a beginning investor or a casual investor, it's very important to understand the power of diversification. Many people, they, like they, they'll say, oh, I, I think that one did well, so give me a little bit of that. And no, oh, I think mm -hmm. I read in a magazine that this one did well, so give me a little bit of that. And so they don't have often a well-diversified portfolio, different types of stocks of different sizes, different nationalities, value stocks versus growth stocks. Um, they don't have different types of bonds, whether they're treasury bonds or corporate bonds or mortgage-backed securities, um, inflation protection, uh, inflation protection securities, alternative investments, like we said, real estate, precious metals, mm -hmm. infrastructure funds. So they often will buy what they know or what they've heard of. And so the portfolio can be extremely concentrated, like concentrated in US large cap, US large size stocks, or maybe they have only US stocks and they don't really have any international, or maybe they have just treasury bonds, but they don't have some of the other bonds. So that's one of the things that we can say is the diversification is really important. It's one of the fundamental lessons of investing because that helps to smooth out the volatility of the portfolio because one never can pick uh, with any degree of certainty which asset subclasses are going to do well in any one year, any one period. So you want to have all the different major asset subclasses so then when some are not doing well, others are going to be picking up the slack and they're going to be doing well or at least they'll do less poorly. So by being able to diversify and, uh, and, re and kind of smooth out the volatility, not only will you have better, there's no guarantee of this, but over the long term, it's usually better returns. And also it helps people to sleep better at night because you don't have those highest highs and those lowest lows. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the issues, and that's why obviously it's it's uh, it's best practice to work with a professional like yourself, because I you know many people would come to this with a limited understanding of the types of investments that they could even invest in. I mean, you mentioned some alternative investments and some maybe ones that are slightly you know less obvious to people than others, and I think that's the problem. Is like sometimes people just focus a hundred percent on stocks. Exactly, exactly. There's a whole uh, right. People think about stocks. People think about bonds. Maybe some people are you know, thinking about real estate, but there's a whole category of alternative investments. And these we use these uh, a great deal in our clients portfolios. And these are investments where it's a, it's a pretty broad category. It's kind of a hodgepodge category. But the one unifying theme is that they are investments, some stock based, some bond based that do not behave like traditional stocks and bonds. They're not as correlated to traditional stocks and bonds. So when traditional stocks and bonds are up, uh, they're probably going to be uh, up less, or maybe they might even be slightly down. And but 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 conversely, when traditional stocks and bonds are up, uh, I mean when they're down, they will be down less. In fact, they could even be up. So they act as a very nice diversifier, mm -hmm. and they act as a good way to smooth out the portfolio. And that's one of the, for example, one of the things that we did is you know in 2021 and also in the second half of 2020 we started noticing that the valuations of stocks were getting very high um, you know the prices were going very up and the the price to earnings ratio the dollar every dollar how many dollars you'd have to pay for every dollar of earnings was really getting pretty expensive without any financial fundamental justification so we were concerned that you know what goes up for no reason can come down for no reason yeah. when investor sentiment kind of pops so we increased significantly the amount of alternatives that were in our clients portfolios as a kind of shock absorber so when stocks don't do well inevitably one out of every four years the stock market is down these alternative investments will be down less or in fact be up and luckily um, you know they've definitely served well um, our, our clients' portfolios. When, when the market is uncertain and cloudy and you're not really sure it's how stocks are going to do, we tend to increase the amount of alternatives. And conversely, when it's you know, beautiful skies, it's sunny days ahead, and we think that stocks are going to be doing unbelievably well, we tend to reduce the amount of alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the alternatives you think that uh, maybe people are less aware of? Well, I think a good example is one of the things that we're using is uh, called infrastructure funds. So these are stock based investments, but they are investments that have a revenue component. So they could be um, the stocks of companies that um, 
control toll bridges, toll roads, uh, utilities, you know, electric utilities, water utilities, things where there is a lot of regulation by the government, so they don't have as much room for upside during really boom times. But in uncertain times, these utilities are able to submit requests to the government to increase the rates, and usually the rates are increased. And when the rates are increased, you know, the consumers like you and me, we have to pay for water, we have to pay for electricity. So they're able to have steady increases even when the economy is uncertain. So that's one that we like at the moment. Yeah, well, if you're, if you're invested in San Diego electricity and gas right now, they've certainly been able to push their prices up. So uh, <laughs> if you're invested in that, you might be doing all right while that's, we suffer. But that's another story. That's true. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, um, I'm hearing about the utilities in California. Yes. Oh, it's insane. It's insane. Uh, and, just, and, and just as a quick aside, Michael, I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of talk and hype around crypto or currency. And now we're hearing even more about it during this period. What's um, what is your thoughts on that? We, we tend as, an, as, a, as a wealth management firm, we tend to err a little bit on the conservative side. So with that, um, we are always looking at things. We're always gonna be consistently reviewing investments, uh, whether, we, whether we decide to be with them or not. We'll continue every, every X number of months, we'll look at them because things can change all the time. But right now we are not advising our clients to be getting into crypto because it is, a very sentimentally, emotionally driven product. And it's, mm. it goes up and down, not based on really fundamentals. It's not like a, a stock where you can analyze the company and see the revenue stream, or it's not like a bond where you can, you know, you can see the, the, the coupon that you're gonna be getting year after year, and you can see the credit quality, what's the likelihood that you're gonna get that coupon on a consistent basis. It's basically, you know, you buy it, it's, it's a currency, um, you know, there is supply and demand, but just like people don't really, uh, especially normal investors, not really sophisticated investors, don't really go and play the foreign exchange markets because mm -hmm. who knows what's going to happen with, you know, the ruble, who knows what's going to happen with the euro. Um, you have specialized foreign exchange professionals who are trading in and out, but they are dedicated all the time to that, to that space. It's the same thing with cryptocurrency unless you're a real expert and are really studying it, and I don't mean just kind of dabbling in it kind yeah. of as a hobby, one or two hours a week, kind of looking at it, um, we would advise against it. Now, if you want to put a little play money into it, if you want to put in like a little into it where you can afford to lose it all if things went against you and you're okay with that and you're okay to take a little speculative investment just for fun or just for bragging rights because you say, oh, you know, I have uh, Bitcoin and I have some Ethereum, that's okay. But just be prepared to you might win very big and get lucky or you could lose it all. So it's the it's basically the Vegas approach, right? It's like uh, step off your plane with an X amount of money in your pocket and be prepared to lose it. And if you win, hey, that's great. Exactly. Exactly. Know your limit and be able to walk away when the limit is reached. Yeah. OK, so, Michael, what's your last uh, piece of advice to people right now? You know, as I said, maybe people who are panicking a bit or, or confused. What would your, be your advice to them? I think the thing is just, you know, remember that, you know, people might be saying, oh my gosh, this is a scary time, which is completely true. It is a scary time. But remember, we've had scary times before, you know, mm -hmm. we've yeah. had the dot-com bubble burst in the early 2000s. We've had the great financial crisis in, in 2007, 2008, you know, at the, na the, the down, the most down in March of 2009. You know, we're, you know, we've had um, in March, from February to April in 2020 with the coronavirus, where the, the market basically collapsed in about five weeks. We've had these things, but then inevitably things bounce back, bounce back. Now I cannot guarantee with uncertainty that things, with certainty that things will bounce back every single time. But if you looked at the US markets, for example, since, you know, let's say 19, the 1920s to now, there have been a string of constant, you know, World War II, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Seven Days War with Israel and, 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 the, and the Arab states. But the long-term trend of stocks is up. Like we said, when we say one out of every four years, the markets is down. Conversely, that means one out of every, yeah. one out of every three years, the market is up. So if your goal is for the medium to long-term, then and your goals have not changed, 
and we think you should pretty much stick with your portfolio. If you want to make a little bit of a tweak, let's say your, your target asset allocation is 65% stocks, 35% bonds and cash. Mm -hmm. You want to make a little tweak just to kind of take a little bit of the edge off and go maybe to 60% stocks, 40% bonds and cash. Maybe that's something to do to help you sleep better at night. But we would definitely not do anything radical because um, if you get out now, you might feel temporarily great, but then you lock in those losses, right? They're not, they're not permanent losses till you actually make the sale and lock in those losses. Right now, they're just numbers bouncing around on paper. But if you lock in those losses and you say, okay, it's great, I feel great, I'm out of the market now. But then when do you know when to, when's the time to get back into the market? And, and I've been doing this 20 years. And I know we, when I ask clients, they'll say, well, I'll get back into the market when I feel confident that you know, we're not going to be going down anymore. And I said, well, when, when will that be? Well, it will be when I've seen that the market's been doing well for a while. Well, if you wait for the market to have done well for a while, that, in, that by definition means that you're going to miss out on a great amount of the rise up in the market. So you're literally selling at the low point and then you're buying back right. in at a higher point, which is a recipe for disaster. So don't make any sudden moves. Have confidence in your long-term plan. If you need to work with a financial advisor or wealth management professional, reach out to them. One of the biggest things we do is to help clients avoid making the big mistakes by getting out or getting in at the wrong time. Yeah, listen, that's fantastic. Fantastic advice, Michael. And yeah, and I agree with you. I mean, I came to the States in the 90s uh, during the dot-com era, came to Silicon Valley. And since I've been here, we've had the dot-com explosion and implosion. We've had 9-11. We've had the financial crisis. We've had coronavirus. Obviously, now we have geopolitical issues going on. It's I agree with you. I, I think I think these kind of crises um, and because of the connectivity and everything across the world, we're going to have more of them. They're going to have bigger impact, but I think we'll recover faster. Right. Definitely. I think that the definitely things will recover, especially, you know, if you're buying quality investments, not speculative investments. But if you do your research, we tend to be value investors. We're looking like, what do we think the real price of this should be if we did an arm's length transaction. And if you buy quality stuff and we like to buy it at a discount, that's being a value investor, we want to buy things on sale. So that if we buy it on sale, then we're be, when the market actually realizes what it's worth, the market will go up and we'll be able to sell at the price that it's really, really worth. If There will be times though when things get buffeted around and, and mm -hmm. that is inevitable. And what I would say to people right now is don't, you know, don't look at the, don't look at CNBC every day and being, you know, freaking out because, you know, on the television, they want to get ratings, right? And one of the ways to get ratings is saying sensational things. So one day it could be like, is the market going to 50,000? And the other day it could be like, oh my gosh, are we going into the next depression? So it, it makes people very scared emotionally. So we would say kind of read, if you want to read certain things, like read the Wall Street Journal, read Kiplinger's personal finance. Don't look at your portfolio every day to see how it's doing. Maybe check in once a month maybe check in once a quarter if you can, if you can, if you can uh, keep yourself from checking in too frequently. You don't want to get yourself thinking in an emotional level, like at the amygdala level, like the lizard level. Mm -hmm. You want to be trying to be calm and rational and not make any sudden moves, which could unnecessarily detriment your portfolio. Yeah, no, I think that's a I think that's a fantastic uh, piece of advice for everybody. Um, all of Michael's information is going to be below this video. Uh, but before we go, Michael, do quickly tell us about you and your company. Well, sure. Yes. Altfest Personal Wealth. Thank you so much for having me again, John. I greatly appreciate it. Altfest Personal Wealth Management is a comprehensive wealth management firm, a uh, family owned firm. Uh, it has about $1.6 billion of assets under management. And we differentiate ourselves because one, we're a family owned firm. So our fa uh, the Altfest family's name is on the door. So we actually really care highly about our reputation. So we want to be extremely ethical. We also are fiduciaries, which means we are legally structured to always put our clients' interests first all the time. So you don't have to be worrying about conflicting agendas. And also we're fee-only advisors, which means that we only get fees from our actual clients. We don't take any commissions. We don't get any bonus or incentive fees from the investment companies that want us to sell their investments or their insurance. We are completely on the side of the client. And so we're able to think 100%, whether a client agrees with our advice, agrees 50% or doesn't agree at all, our advice is not going to change because we're trying to put our best thinking for the client and help them to optimize not just their investments, but all the different areas of personal financial planning, such as retirement, tax, you know, uh, estate, 
insurance, social security, to make sure everything is fully optimized to be able to achieve the goals of our clients' families and their personal things so that they have one fewer thing to worry about. Yeah, listen, fantastic. I would really encourage you to go check it out. And uh, especially, as I said, especially if you're if you're uncertain, if you're thinking of getting into investing, whatever it is, go go check out, check out a professional like Michael. It's always worthwhile. And the good um, thing is that it's it's, you know, they're welcome to have a complimentary meeting with no obligation. Um, if we can help you, we'll, we'll tell you how. If we don't think we can help you, we'll point you to resources where we think we will be, will be able to help you so that can be value added even the initial. meeting. Perfect. That's great. Uh, yeah, we. Broker of capabilities, that's what we call mm -hmm. that. <laughs> all right, listen, thanks again, Michael. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. It's been wonderful. All the best.